Welcome everyone to the Change Starts Here podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Odom. In this week's episode, we welcome a good friend of mine, Lynn Fox. Lynn is a longtime educator from teacher to uh, district administrator, and she has worked with Franklin Covey, I think maybe a little bit longer, or at least as long as I've been here for over 12 years. Um, but she is someone who is just incredibly, I mean, we end the podcast talking about curiosity being one of the most important things anyone can have or skills anyone could have. And I think she she embodies that. And what she has done for us, she has worked as a coach consultant in the US and has worked her way uh, from helping develop solutions for Franklin Covey education across the globe for our international team. And most recently, she has focused on building out extended learning experiences for summer school and before and after school care. And so we geek out on all things that she's worked on. I spend way more time than I meant to on her international work, but I just find her really fascinating and very thoughtful. And so I think you'll enjoy her, the sincerity behind her answers and the depth of what she thinks about things. And then we dive into the actual extended learning um, gamification, whole person learning thing that she's been building, which has been awesome and had a great impact in San Diego and in Louisville, Kentucky. And it was just really interesting. I mean, it, you'll see quickly how comfortable we are together. And so I think it's a, a conversation that I definitely enjoy just because Lynn is Lynn and she's very easy to talk to, but you always walk away from engaging with Lynn, I think, as being smarter. And it's not because she's trying to wax poetically about the things that she knows because she's a very smart person, but she asks good questions. She gives really direct, thoughtful responses. And so you just, you walk away feeling smarter and getting better. And so I think that's what this conversation was about today. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, as always, uh, thank you. If you're a subscriber, we appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. But most importantly, I would love for you as you hear this, if there's someone in your life who could use the ideas that Lynn shares with us or just some encouragement that uh, Lynn shares. Please share this podcast with them, this episode with them. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Enjoy the episode. Thanks. All right, Lynn, thank you so much for making time to be here with us today. Great to be with you, Dustin, as always. So I am excited. Um, I mentioned in my intro how I have known you since probably my first or second week on the job here. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I remember most is, you know, I, I came from the education school turnaround space, and I just wanted to be around people who also geeked out about Franklin Covey and the leader of me work, but the actual work itself. And you're someone who just oozes thoughtfulness. You're someone who just oozes and thinks about how do we solve the toughest problems in education? And so I have looked up to you for over a decade now. And when I had the opportunity to have you on, I'm way excited. So thank you for making time to be here. Doesn't that so kind of you right back at you. I'm so excited that you're part of my life. Yeah. So anyways, uh, those are for the folks who are listening, uh, who don't know you, let's start off with our same question. We start with everybody, which is, who are you and what do you love about what you do? Well, I am a 30-year educator, developer, and consultant, having worked both nationally and globally. But what I absolutely love is cracking the code on new innovations in the field of education that support the growth of students, staff, and families. So it's really around that code cracking and seeing the impact. Well, I know that you've had a number of roles in the world of education. And can you just give yeah. us a taste of your background and academic career before you got to Franklin Covey? Yeah, I've been very blessed to have a lot of experience in my life. I've taught um, K through 12. I have been an assistant principal. I've been a director for PD curriculum and assessment of a large district in New Jersey. I've worked at the state level in New Jersey as a performance assessment expert in working and developing um, performance assessments. And then my love and passion for social emotional learning drove me to really find and find Franklin Covey. And so for years, I worked in the United States as a coach consultant before I joined the international team, where I worked as the director of PD of professional learning and curriculum for the international space and got to help bring the leader me process to over 60 countries. 
now I really use the, all of that experience in developing solutions, um, like code cracking, right? In the space of saying, what's our greatest challenge in education and how can we innovate in a way that meets the needs of both educators, kids and our world? I'm curious. I mean, again, you have an extensive background working with schools, but uh, coming from kind of the American system and trying to apply some of your ideas and vision internationally, how, how has that helped you grow as a developer? How has that shaped your thinking about education and uh, you said social emotional learning or just like leadership development and kids? Well, you know, it's interesting. The experience of working across the United States and then across the globe tells us we're all really the same, right? We're all humans in the space of education. And 99%, 99.9% of the schools around the world are identical. It didn't matter what country I landed in or where I landed. It, we're all working in the same organizational structure. And the only variation was really around the standards and the culture itself like how we see the world culturally, but from the needs and solutions in education, it's really the same platform, but just coming at it from a different angle, from a cultural experience. So how do you approach something different, you know, from uh, Brazil to Japan to uh, Ghana? I'm just I'm trying to think of all the different places you could be. H how do you help take a disciplined approach of like, here's the things that are the same, and then how do we make sure that this you develop something it's personal to that culture. Yeah. Well, the first thing you do in, when you, you know, any of us, if we step foot in another country, we should really be seeking to understand that culture, norms, experiences, wants, hope, and dreams. Like it's the first job to be done is seek to understand and embrace that understanding and then come to agreement. Um, what are we trying to solve? Right? So if we know, this is where you're coming from, and this is where we want to be. How do we work together to, to solution towards that um, challenge we're trying to solve? But I think that's the big thing as an American or coming from the United States lens is recognizing we don't know it all. And there's greatness in every single culture around the world. And it's about tapping that greatness and bringing it all together so that um, we can learn and grow together. Have you noticed, uh, obviously, um, you know, this is not a political show by any means. And so it's not about uh, a certain president. But uh, when I was going to Canada for uh, several years, yeah. I felt there was some sort of backlash or concern that we had to get over of an American company who, again, at that time, it was just we weren't seen with prestige. I felt like because we were an American company for a bit in, in Canada, have you noticed that that challenge in the past? And if so, how do you help get over that when you, you work internationally? It's actually too, it's actually more regional in my mind. So it depends on where you're like I have after having those experiences have broken up the world kind of in my brain around eight regional cultures. Like you have your individual country culture, but then you have like eight regional mindsets, right? So like example, in Western culture, us Europeans, Canadians, Australians, we often think with the head, then the heart second. That's how we approach the world. Whereas um, Latin American culture is heart first, then the head. They come with love before they come with thinking. So it's really kind of a cool mindset of knowing when you're stepping in. But because of that, that also tells us more of like the judgment side of it. So many cultures are reticent of an American or an American company coming in. And then there's others, Latin America, Asia, um, Southeast Asia, where they really embrace American ideas coming in. So it's it depends on where you are in the world and how that was perceived. So I think if we approach it with humility, wherever we go, we come in with a humility as though we don't know more than you. We're here to work together to say, we have this amazing solution in leadership and life skills. Let's see how this resonates and meets your needs and how we can meld that together to um, work together. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I, I think, I mean, again, uh, it's kind of what I said to start off with. I, I'm sure I made you feel a little awkward given my praise I heaped on you, but I just, I love how you are, con you're a consummate learner and you're trying to 
piece things together, right? So you lead with humility, but you also are incredibly smart. And so I'm sure that's hard sometimes when you're like, I really am humble, but I just have a lot of big ideas. And so, uh, you know, you know, obviously we brought you on to talk about extended learning, which I promise we'll get to. You said something in your intro that w- one of the things that brought you to kind of Franklin Covey education was your, your passion for social emotional learning or leadership development. Um, but you and I geeked out and we still geek out on academic performance and how it moves the needle. How, how do you uh, square that, right? Because I, I'm in Florida right now where I, I spend a lot of times and there's a, a focus on, yes, leadership development skills, but really it's the classical, you know, let's get good grades. Let's focus on just the core. How do you see those two going together when you are someone who is committed to great academic performance? How does social emotional learning play out and why did you choose to come with us all right so it's a little it's a little professional and personal at the same time in this solution right so i've been in the game for over 30 years and from a very young age as an educator i realized that if i built a deep relationship with my students if i had a relationship with them and they knew i loved and cared for them they would perform more so i learned at a young age If that connection, social, emotional, if I was pouring into them as a human being first, the academics would rise. And then if you watch where we are in academics overall, where the whole purpose of education, we keep filling the mind and we're preparing kids for a college or career from a mind thinking space. But what's the real job to be done? We really need to prepare people to build a life. So that's where it became committed because I started in the time, like in the 90s as an educator, when there's a bit more freedom, like my first job, it was we had much more freedom in what we were allowed to do, much more creativity. And then over that time period, when No Child Left Behind came in and all these other rules, the pendulum swung to many places that were saying that teachers had to be on the same exact page at the same time. Like the creativity was being pulled out of education. And that's where I became more and more passionate um, about leadership and life skills, the, the human side of education, because it didn't matter how much we're pouring into someone's brain if we're not preparing them for the human life. Yep. And that, because that's all what it's about. So and I think we're still, the pendulum's still too far on pouring into the brain, academic, 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 that we need to pull back and balance and make the space for both the social, emotional or leadership and life skills along with academics that come together. Hold on, I'm going I'm to interrupt just because you've traveled yeah. the world, and I know that you and I have had this debate before. Um, what about those, those studies that, that talk about uh, American kids or even adults' confidence of like overconfidence, but yet competence may not be as strong, right? And so... I hear you. So there would be there, so the argument to that would be like, well, but Lynn, we've got to focus on academics. We're getting, you know, killed by the rest of the world. Why are we going to spend time building on the, the life skills and leadership and social emotional learning? Because I can believe, I believe you can do both. I think part of our challenge, the reason why we are not where we need to be, so to speak, as an American, and I'm assuming you're going off of the PISA test, right? At OECD, the one that standardizes across the world. Part is because of our approach, like we're not, bring, if you bring in leadership, life skills or the social, emotional, treat the human side, yep. we can turn that inner motivation on too much, in my opinion, and from my experience in our U.S. world is external reinforcement, external carrots and sticks, so to speak, to get kids to perform versus creating that internal Drive and finding your voice, which is part of the reason I've always been around leading me and can't get it out of my blood because it's the balance of both. We're like we're coming and working in the inner voice and unleashing the human being so that they can also unleash their academic drive. And we've seen yeah. that happen. No, I, I love that. I mean, one of the reasons why we named the podcast Change Start Here is that we believe like life's about a mirror first before it's about anything else. Like you got to work on yourself. You got to work on your motivation you gotta work on your challenges before you can influence or impact anything else. And so it sounds yeah. like that's, that's what you're saying. Essentially like the most powerful way to like ignite a learner is to help them get deep inside versus just giving them kind of a roadmap, I guess. Well, yeah. Well, what's their purpose, right? So I remember as a young kid, when I turned on my light 
for academics. Like I never thought I was smart. I just crack up that you keep saying you're so smart. You're so smart. I'm like, I never thought I was so smart person. I was not a good test taker. Like I'm still sometimes amazed at what I've been able to do in my life so far. Um, because it was a coach and another teacher that came into my life and told me my worth and potential. So when Stephen Covey says, Leadership is communicating someone's worth and potential so clearly that they're inspired to see it in themselves. That was what happened to me when people turned that light on because they poured into me as a human being and told me my worth and potential. In too much in our system, the pendulum swung to a child's worth and value is the test. Yeah. How, like, think about how we're judged in schools. Like, your, your success has way so much pressure on the academic side that it can hold kiddos back from right. their experience. And I guess that's why I believe so much in that balance. Yeah. Well, uh, I know I brought you on to talk about extended learning, but I, I think, you know, when I, when I say you're smart, it's because you listen really well, you care, you're curious, and you also, you know, I don't know if it's the the Northeast side of you, you're not scared to share your ideas or your opinions, which I appreciate tremendously. And so, uh, sorry to go down that rabbit hole with you. Let's talk extended learning. So you and I, uh, I haven't been in the game since the 90s, I guess I should tell everybody, but uh, I've been in a while. Thank you for showing how young you are. <laughs> <laughs> See, I knew you would appreciate my sarcasm. So anyways, the I, I would say, you know, my time working in at least urban districts, um, especially in the Midwest, we talked about extended learning, but we kind of looked at it as like, oh, we've got some partners that, that kind of do that, that kind of help out yeah. after school, before school. We have some community service. Like we just kind of, it's a, it was kind of an afterthought, quite honestly. I feel like, it's become more important than ever. And I'm just curious, can you just define how, how do you define extended learning time and tell me if you think it's more important than ever and why it's so important right now? Yeah. It's so fascinating that I'm in this space right now, developing in this space because I never imagined, right? right. <laughs> so we're defining extended learning as summer learning opportunities and after school learning opportunities in the term extended, because in some spaces across the nation, it's, you know, out of school time or, right? So that space has become more important after COVID, right? Many, many people are in the game of summer and after school looking at closing the COVID gap that occurred. But what we noticed happening was a lot more of the same. So what you're getting in the school day in the year, you would get more of that same type of learning in the summer and then more in the after school space. That was one challenge um, that made us say, no, like we can use this and still bring creativity, fun and bring it like summer fun into learning, but also meet the needs of kiddos in that gap, yes. specifically targeting leadership and life skills. Um, and also the other area that was interesting was looking at the change in staffing teacher shortages, who's in this space, um, certificated staff members, non-certificated staff members, and then really getting creative and looking at this space for teenagers to have employment opportunities and career path experiences. So that's what got us creating and innovating in the space itself because of the opportunity to meet that mission of, wow, there's a way to bring learning for leadership and life skills in summer and after school that raise up both the kids we're trying to serve and staff that we can raise up. And the one last piece of that is that also extended because there's also great partnerships between community and schools coming together. Yeah. So, you know, when I think about summer, you know, I would usually think, all right, so summer learning, that's for the kids who need remediation, for lack of a better term. That's for teachers just kind of go, they teach the subject, kids get the subject and they're out. Why is a district choosing to partner with us and helping them solve challenges? Because I think my view on that is incredibly limited. So what, what am I missing? Well, I think our educators are just brilliant, first of all. Our we have great educators around the United States. And they are, there's great academic solutions in that space, but they also are looking to bring in the leadership and life skills and to continue to develop that because they see the same vision around what kids need today. 
right? Mm -hmm. They're recognizing the skill sets and competencies that are missing. And then they find that Franklin Covey really brings those solutions to the table that can partner with their academic programs. So you are accurate in the remediation aspect. Kids who need summer school to raise them up. And so they still also want to bring in the competence around leadership and life skills into it. Then we also have enrichment, people who are looking to raise up through enrichment. Um, And the after school space in particular as well is looking to both. They have many more staff in that space that don't have the educational background in working and working and supporting kids. So they're looking to raise them up. So I think it's both from the remediation and recognizing we still need leadership and life skills or social emotional learning, um, whether it's the enrichment side or whether it's the academic remediation. So uh, I recently saw a video called The Summer of Joy, and I think it's the work that you've helped uh, lead and create in San Diego. Mm, Yeah. That speaks to me because I, again... When I think about summer professional development, kids going to school, like it's usually, I love the word joy, but I would not define that as joy. So for those folks who have no idea what I'm talking about, what is this summer of joy from like the implementation? Like, tell me, tell me what the actual project was or is, because I think it's still ongoing. Yeah, that's the Teens Leadership Institute. That yeah. summer of joy. So the teens that signed up for Leadership Institute, where they, it's kind of imagine they get to learn seven habits of highly effective people with old school camp games and a deep reflection of self in gamification, right? Mm-hmm. So they come in and the real purpose is to raise them up so they can learn how to lead self, know who I am and what I want to become okay. and learn to lead and work well with others. That's where our competence works around. So it's very collaborative. So our facilitators are very much guides on the side. It's not teaching, it's experiential. So um, the kids have engagement activities and games where they make deep connections with each other while they're learning the seven habits and then processing it and applying it to their own life. Yeah. So that why it was joy was because it was the joy of like them. Like I, I had a kiddo, a young teen, not, I won't say her name, where she kind of came into it with life just happens to me. She had a really kind of hard life. Many of the kids, their brain, their their vision of school is like, school, it happens to me. Home happens to me. This is just life. There's nothing I can do. And it's kind of like they have this kind of burden and heavy on their back. And as they go through the Institute, and I've seen it both in Louisville and in Louisville, Kentucky, and in San Diego, their whole demeanor changes by the end. They just kind of like, standing taller and new paradigms of life of like life doesn't happen to me Mm. i can influence my life i can lead my life regardless of the circumstances i am i the circumstances i live within by you know using the practices and principles of seven habits so lynn it sounds like Students, and again, I don't remember the number of how many students, but it sounds like the students go through a transformation, as you described, over the summer, but then they're empowered, implored, instructed, I don't know the right word, to go back and create that kind of transformation in the lives at their high school. And so is that is that correct? Is that part of the plan or does that just happen organically? Yeah, that's it's really great that you're asking that because it really depends on the vision of the school, right? So when we partner with a school or a community, and I want to make up bring up community members we really kind of lean into like, what's your vision? So how we can help them. So in the case of San Diego Unified School District, we did the Leadership Institute, raising up the teens so they could really kind of take on the paradigms and principles of lead self, know how to lead their own life, and then also lead others, and then choose to impact. And we invite them. No one is forced to saying, you, if this was such an impactful experience for you in the summer, How do you think it would be helping your colleagues in school, your peers? And so the school that we're referencing, um, Crawford High School, they had this vision saying, let's see if these teens want to go into advisory period and teach the seven habits to their peers in a similar model that they experienced with us. It was just a beautiful thing because they did it. 
And so, and also it's like a teach to learn. Like when you teach something, you learn it better for your own life. But these teens, and if you watch that video, they'll say, like the one kiddo, I remember how quiet she was. And she was like, and in the in the video, she says, I was shy. I never thought I could do anything like this. And now she's going into advisory periods and teaching her peers, mm-hmm. running these experiences for them to learn the principles. So they're impacting that school community because that's what the hope and dream was for that school. Then, though, if you go into, say, like Louisville, Kentucky, which they, you know, 2021 hats off, they came to us and said, this great director at the um, school level said, I really want to do something for our teens. And this is where it was birthed, the first leadership institute, but it was a partnership between J school district and the community summer works program. And so those teens, what was built for that impact was leadership institute. But then they impact their community by teens in the summer school. So they have a job in the summer. They're 15 and above working permit. They literally get a job, which is fantastic, where they are in training at the, and they do everything they need, you know, and that, but they also get to teach the seven habits through gamification. Mm-hmm. And at the end though, which was really impactful, we brought them back together for a reflective summit and they set goals for their, leading their own life. And then also what's the next level of impact you want to make in your community. And we're coming into our third year of that one is expanding. So wow. mm-hmm. yeah, their, their goal, I believe this year is to do 150 teens. So, and these are teens from any background, like any background. You, you've talked a lot about teens. Is the solution that you're talking about or you've helped build for K-12, pre-K-12, or is it just more teens? Yeah, because you brought up the one from San Diego, Summer of Joy. That was the teens. But we also have our, we have an imagination series curriculum in the summer, and it's K through eight. And I like to think of it as like, think of seven habits um, with old school summer camp games and our wreck it journal. We call it altering. So the materials are manageable, changing. And that's what we birthed for summer fun and joy. Um, So it's very exploratory and imagination brings back high level of creativity and deep social connection. So that, so that's, I think that's key, right? Because I, um, can just imagine kids, you know, coming in and thinking, okay, I got to do more school. Oh, I got to learn the seven habits. Oh, great. You're telling me the experience is not sit and get. It's very engaging for kids. They get a chance to just almost learn while they're not realizing they're learning. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. And it's a new way of being for the the teachers because, you know, teachers are used to being sage on the stage and having direct and do all the, all the teaching, know all the content. Yep. But in this case, they're the guide. So they're part of the fun. They're a guide on the side and part of the fun. And so um, because it's gamified and active engagement, the power of it is so you go in, you set up the game or the activity with brief out. So the teacher doesn't have to teach. The teacher has to be really good at questions because you're pulling the deep connections from the kids and empowering their voice. Got it. So they they can be, they don't necessarily have to have all the teaching acumen. They just have to be really interested, listen, and encourage the dialogue, basically, is what you're saying. And we have certificated educators who do it really, really well, right? And then we also have teens teaching this in the summer through our, and that's the pairing of our Leadership Institute and Teach to Learn. So the teens also learn to do the gamification with kids. That's really cool. And that, I mean, my kids would, you know, my kids nine, six, and two, if they had a teen doing something with them over the summer, I'm sure they'd be way more inspired than sometimes, you know, me as an adult doing it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I'm glad you said that because that was, I think why um, JCPS, when they saw the major impact in the teens themselves, the transformation, some of me is saying, I now want to be a teacher. I now know this is what I want to go into, but then the staff, when I went and visited the school, I went around and I had I visited the schools and I actually observed some kids and gave them feedback like I would when I used to run a school. This, the leaders of the summer school and summer camps were saying, we can't live without these teens because those little ones look up to them. They listen to them so much. Like that power of the teen energy with the K-5 and K-8 is magic. 
in the I'm impact in their lives. Mm-hmm. So uh, just let's spend a little bit of time. So am I, um, you know, I travel a bunch. My wife works crazy hours for her school district. And so uh, our two oldest boys are very involved in before care and after care at their schools. And uh, my oldest one is now starting to, he's nine, starting to tell me a lot more. And last week, I didn't know that their after school program, they call it Flyers Club, has a character ed component. And I picked him up for something. He goes, oh, thank God you picked me up. I didn't want to do Character Wednesday. And I'm like, what is Character Wednesday? I'm all excited. This is my life. I'm like, that sounds great. And <laughs> it's like, oh, we have to sit there and get it. And I don't know, just not that fun. And so what what are we doing or what are you, what are you designed in the after school, before school space to not have I'm not, forget about the rest of the kids to not have Luke Taylor Odom coming home saying, oh, it's Character Wednesday. <laughs> All right. In the after school space, um, we we have like a vision on two parts. One, raising up the staff that are in this space to really know how to build a really safe, caring, and sense of belonging culture so kids want to be there. So we teach them the mindset, skill set, tool set to do that space. Cause that's matters, you know, because many after school programs vary and sometimes it's just you know, sometimes glorified babysitting just, or sometimes it's really great programming um, with great vision and anywhere in between. So one is raising up to say, how do you build this wonderful culture, safe, caring sense of belonging with mindset skills or two set. And then the other side is saying, now we also want to bring in building up the competence. So in Franklin Covey in the leadership portrait. Do you're familiar with the student leadership portrait in that has the leadership and life skills competence. And so there are competence that are on there to say, these are what we pour into kids K through 12. Right. And you, under, under each major competence, there are three sub competencies. But when you really break down a competence like relationship building, communication, responsibility. If you take those three big competence and break them down to their subparts, underneath that are building block skills that we often don't get to in schools. So that's our goal in the after school space. It's called the exploration series. And in a 20 to 30 minute series, we're, we're, we're targeting the building block skill. But once again, through gamification, right? So Dustin, if you think of communication, what building block skills do you think of in communication? Like what comes to mind? You gotta be able to listen. You gotta be able to uh, clearly articulate your ideas. And so speaking. communicate them. Yeah, speaking okay. even written, I guess. But speaking is what I think about. Okay. I also think about greeting. I think about body language. I think about tone. Because listening and speaking, those two can even be broken down to even deeper, five types of listening, even our speaking, our different ways of speaking. Like, if you break those down, that's what we're going after in this exploration series. So they get concrete yeah. practice in those skills, those micro skills. I, we, sorry, I just thought that you broke down body language and tone because the number of arguments I've got into with you and my amazing bride uh, or even, you know, my nine-year-old of, well, I, I said this, I'm like, well, yeah, but it was how you said it. It was your body language and your tone that made me think otherwise. So I love that you have that skill uh, focus there. Yeah. And I think that's excited about it. I truly never thought I would be geeked out in curriculum for the after school space. It was my thing, but because it's after school, we have, we have an opportunity to be really creative. And um, I'm so excited about the micro skill set because I even think about my own upbringing in the components I missed and had to learn <laughs> through trials and tribulations of life yep. because we just didn't get those micro skills. So we can introduce the micro skill or that building skill, practice in a fun, creative way. We're bringing it to the head, like you're now aware. They're having a social, emotional experience to the heart, and then they apply it. So it's a head, heart, and knees experience, which is how you truly develop social, emotional competence or leadership and life skills. Um, but it's good for the kids, and it's good for the adults. That's awesome. Well, uh, as people are interested in diving into this space, what's the best way for them to learn a little bit more? Uh, I know there's a landing page, I believe, on uh, leadermeet.org, mm-hmm. but is that generally where you send people when they want to learn more? 
Yeah, yeah. There's also a QR code that they could sign and say, I want to learn more. Uh, we have a webinar coming up that's on the landing page. I can send that link. We have a webinar this week, um, but the going to landing page and filling out you want to learn and it'll drive you to the right person. Awesome. All right. Uh, so as you know, I promised I'd get you out of here on time. We're going to do it. Uh, we always end with the same four questions. And so these are rapid <laughs> fire. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> then, then, if you're a rapid fire, don't overthink. You're allowed to share a little bit of context, but uh, these are supposed to be easy okay. answers, not stressful question and answers. So, All right, we'll try this. One, what is a habit or discipline that you use on a daily or weekly basis to help you be the best version of yourself? I know when I wake up every morning before I get out of bed, I visualize the type of day I want to have. I set my intention for the day. That's awesome. And so even if, how, how does that help you? Let's say again, in my house, I know you've got kids yourself, but I've got the nine, six and two year old. So I, I picture myself doing that all of a sudden walking out and two kids fighting already. And I'm like, man, I've been up three minutes and my day is shot. So how does that help you when you take your first, you know, gut punch of the day? I think it sets you in the right place. Like it creates a yeah. in response because if you said it, like you're mindful enough before you step out of bed to say, visualize the type of day you want to have it kind of sets your paradigm and whatever yeah. hits you you're like ah, oh, i can we can deal with this i love it all right uh what's a book you've read or books i'll let you have a couple if you need to that you've either read in your lifetime or recently that you think others need to check out way too many books to think about but the one book i think that had such a major impact on me to think differently is outliers by malcolm gladwell have you ever read it yeah it just, I, one, I love social science and research and all that and seeing through a different lens, but um, that book just helped me see the world differently. Yep. Yeah, Outliers and Blink. Blink was another one that uh, I loved as well. But Outliers was my first one with him. Um, I love it. All right. Uh, this is the one that might have stressed you out when we talked in the, the pregame <laughs> level this morning, but uh, I used to ask what's your favorite playlist, but, you know, living in St. Louis, we're a baseball town and my nine-year-old wants us to ask about what he always asks everybody, what's your favorite, what would be your walk-up song, right? So in baseball, you've got the song that you play as you walk up to the batter's box. And so I'm asking everybody, what's your walk-up song, Lynn? What's a motivational song that you, you listen to? So the reason why this stressed me out before was because I was thinking my listening is so eclectic. My playlist is everything, you know, from... Billy Joel to Maroon 5 to it's all over the place. Yeah. And so, but the first song that came to mind was if I really want to get pumped. It's right now, right now, it would be Lizzo. It's about damn time. Yes. <laughs> I love you, Lynn. See, I knew you had the courage to say it. It's okay. The, you know, like, it's the one that you, you like, you turn on, you crank in your house, but no yes. one doesn't count anybody. <laughs> I was like, I, I love it. And also, Two, as my son has uh, taught me, the walk-up songs change, right? So that as you hear a new song or yeah. you hear something else, like you can break it. And so what's really important is what would your walk-up song be now? And I love that you have Lizzo because my wife might actually join you on that one. So uh, <laughs> if you haven't listened to it, go turn it up. I totally agree. All right, last one. <laughs> uh, and I'll give you your day back. What, you know, you're, you're someone who is, around really smart people. I'm sure as you travel um, the world or continental US, you're just around really incredible people. And so what's the best piece of leadership advice or personal change advice you've come across recently that uh, you've not been able to get out of your mind that you're like, man, I got to share this with somebody. I got to, you keep just talking about it. Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I think I have had to grow so much in my lifetime and there's so much more, right? Like I wish everything I knew now, I knew way back when, but I don't regret that journey. Um, I think the best advice is be curious. Like no matter what happens in life, good, bad, or ugly, before judging it, take a moment and just be curious. We react so fast. And I used to do this all the time. Like I was a stress monkey, overachiever, trying to like, I was overdoing it all the time because I think I was trying to fulfill a void inside me of worth and value somehow. And just over um, thinking about just helping the world more than realizing. 
But now when things happen, I can let it roll so much easier. So when things happen or someone behaves a certain way and it pings an emotion, positively or negatively, taking a step and going, hmm, let me just be curious about why I feel the way I feel and why they're behaving the way they're behaving. And then it just allows so much deeper understanding and a better reaction. So I think it's the, it pulls us out of judgment. Mm -hmm. I I love it. And I would say that would be a good turn. That's probably why I call you so smart is that maybe you're not that smart, Lynn. Now that I've talked it out and you've given all these answers, maybe you're not as smart as I thought you were, but you are curious. (laughs) Uh, I I do. I do appreciate That's one thing that is very true around you is that um, you are very curious about people and also how the world works or how things work. And so um, I appreciate you sharing that. Well, yeah. And I would say just last note on that is surround yourself with people that fill you right fine. And I do have to share with you is like, I think people should study great leaders. They admire not just experience and take it in, but when you see someone giving a great speech or you see someone running a great meeting, or you see someone who broke down and solved a problem, take the time to say, well, how did they do that? Because that's how we learn those great skills. Um, so I'm very blessed to have amazing human beings coming in my life. Well, uh, yourself. I feel, yeah, right, myself. But uh, I feel blessed that we've had you here today. Thank you for making time for us. Thank you for all the hard work you're doing. And um, I look forward to hopefully having you back on the podcast again in the future. Thanks, Dustin. Great to see you. All right, Lynn, appreciate you. Please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, podcast on Apple or Spotify, and help us celebrate the beautiful, messy work of shaping human potential.